Before we begin, I just want to ask us just to get ready to pray. You see, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. First in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm sure these same areas are affected when we pray in this unusual set of circumstances. So let us pray according to the needs that are very evident. We're praying for healing, for safety. We pray for protection. We pray for wisdom. We pray for peace and comfort, Lord. To the sick, to the confined, to those that have lost loved ones, to family and friends. We pray for comfort and peace and understanding. We pray, Lord, for your wisdom to all those that are leading us during this difficult time and to all the decisions that will be made going forward. We pray for the doctors and the nurses, the hospital staff, the researchers, and all that are working so hard to make people comfortable and bring healing to them. I pray that we would also work together and have compassion and understanding during this difficult time. As I said last week, the Bible says in Psalm 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is for people to dwell together in unity. It also says it brings with it great blessings of the Lord. I think we need God's blessing. So let us dwell together in unity. Let us be at peace with one another and let us be patient. Lord, we pray that you would bless and heal and provide for each one and everyone that is in need in this vast world that we live. And I just felt this morning just get us to pray wherever you're at right now, wherever you're watching. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. And Jesus said, After this manner, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those that are our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Good to have you this morning. I have almost an empty building. I have two more people here that are cheering me on from way, way afar. We trust that you're able to see what's going on with us this morning. We trust that you're tuned in and you're ready for the word of the Lord now. As we just read the Lord's Prayer, I want us to go back to... Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. And let's read this verse. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now in just a few minutes, we're going to come back to that particular verse. I believe that we can come away with great value from this situation we're living in. A few things for sure is the value of our freedom. Uh, it feels like things are kind of cramped for us and crimped for us in our lifestyle. We pray that, and I want you to think about the value of your families, your relationships, the value of our community, the value of our job, the value of our homes, our church, and yes, the value of our health. I believe that is in this time of our intersection of our lives that we can begin to value things in a different way. You see, Jesus was crucified in an intersection, and so it is. We are all in an intersection right now as believers and unbelievers alike. The question is, is what are we going to do at this intersection? You see, we've been to intersections before, as we said last week, but what will we do at this intersection in our lives and in this world? Will we make the correct turn or the correct decision? Three weeks ago, as we were beginning to start Lent, my wife shared on temptation, fear, and betrayal. Temptation, fear, and betrayal. We see we've all gone through these areas more than we'd like to uh, admit, but we did, and as we remember, how we overcame them. Let us mem uh, uh, remember that these are platforms for us. There's always going to be temptation. There's always going to be fear. And there's always going to be betrayals that will come our way. As I stated last week, Lent was established to lengthen the days of our remembering the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The word Lent means lengthen. We talked about remembering last week. Why? Because we so easily forget. Oh, by the way, we're going to have our sunrise service drive-in style at 6.30 on Easter morning. You can come and listen to us via Facebook Live or just roll down your window. We're also going to be doing the same thing for the regular Easter service morning at 1030. 
So come on out, tell someone, and next week, obviously, we'll be back doing this again. To get back to the message, on Monday morning, I woke up at 4.38 in the morning. I lay there, and a thought came to me, 70 times 7. I knew there was a scripture verse, and I thought if I lay here, I, I'll, I'll remember it when I wake up in another hour and a half. And I laid there for a second or two, and I said, well, you know, I probably should go ahead and get up. And I got up at 4.38, thereabouts, and sat down on my computer after making some coffee, and I began to type out the message for today. The message was so full that I didn't really do much with it except think about it and meditate about it the next several days. Seventy times seven, I think... If you look at that mathematically, that's 490. I began to think about my wife talking about the temptation, talking about the fear, talking about betrayal. And when the word betrayal came, I thought about the word forgiveness, 70 times 7. As we read earlier, Lord's Prayer says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is, as I said, at the very beginning of Christ's ministry. He's just been baptized. He's just in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and he throws this prayer in about how to pray. He says, forgive us our debts. Forgive us those that have hurt us. Forgive us, Lord, help us forgive those that have damaged us or betrayed us as we forgive our debtors. Lord, forgive us. And then he goes on to, skips a couple verses down in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. It says, for if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Isn't that powerful? If you forgive men, God will forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So there's a, a, a tremendous responsibility that we have to forgive other people. Now, I'm not saying that's easy, but we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. You see, Jesus taught on forgiveness, the need to forgive, and the power of forgiveness before he ever went to the cross. He doesn't say, I want to make this note, he doesn't say forget. That's another level. That's like another message altogether. And just to say this, forgetting takes a little time. It does not say you will be able to trust people right away. That takes time as well. And this works differently for every person. Every one of us process and deal with things differently. You see, you can love a person, but yet not trust them. We do it all the time. There's lots of people that we love. We tell them we love them. But, you know, in, in, in the long term, we don't know if we really trust them because that's born out of relationship. And you can love a person after you've forgiven them, but maybe not forget what happened. And that's okay, too. Can we get the place of trust back? The answer is yes. Can we get to a place of forgetting? And I think that can happen too, but it takes time. It takes a long, long time. As I was sharing with a friend of mine this morning, you know, um, it's kind of like when you walk on the side of the, on the water side by the ocean and you have your footprints in the, in the sand and as the sea keeps coming and going, coming and going, eventually those footprints are gone. And it's just a faint memory in the end or just something that you know happened. Now, we could take a picture of those footprints, and you would never forget about what those footprints looked like. But if it was just the ocean and the sand, eventually the ebbing and the flowing, the erosion of the water would take away those footprints. We would hope that forgiving people in the beginning can get us to the place of those things eventually being erased. But we need and we have to get to this place of forgiveness first. You might say, how? Now, I'll just say this. The answer is time. In relationships, time itself will bring healing. Time is the easy part of it. You don't have to be engaged with that person to be healed. Let's think about this. The doctor tells you what is wrong with you. He treats you. You follow the doctor's orders. You take the meds. You go home. Time is the next part of the essence. Following the doctor's orders and taking the prescribed medicines, healing will come. Now, mind you, everyone's not going to get healed at the same rate. Everyone does not respond the same way. 
Some of us need extra treatment. Some of us need another consultation. Some of us need some more medicine like the grace of God, the mercy of God. Because we don't all respond the same. So I decided to do a little research about this. And the Bible talks about in, in, in the book of Corinthians, it talks about when the Lord's Prayer it talks about many sick are sick among you. Johns Hopkins Medical Center has a whole idea about healing in relation to forgiveness. Johns Hopkins has an article that says forgiveness. Your health depends on it. I just want to challenge you right now to think about your health, your mental health, your physical health, your emotional health, and think about forgiveness this morning. Whether it's a simple spat that you and your spouse, Johns Hopkins says, or a long-held resentment toward, toward a family member or friend, and unresolved conflict they discover can go deeper than you may realize. It may be affecting your physical health, your physical well-being. The good news is this. Studies have found that the act of forgiveness, this is from the medical standpoint, not spiritually, can cause you to reap huge rewards for your health. Now, who, could like, who would like to be healthier? I would. It can also lower the risk of heart attack. It can improve your cholesterol levels and your sleep situation. It could reduce pain in your body. It could change your blood pressure. It could help you with your levels of anxiety, depression, and your stress. That's what forgiveness, uh, that's what forgiveness will do for a person. And research points to an increase in the forgiveness health connection to a person's age. So you can actually live longer, live better. You can sleep better. Your physical being is going to be better. Your health is going to be better. Your cholesterol is better. Your uh, pain is going to be less. And your anxiety and depression. Stress, all that's going to change if you can get to a place of forgiveness. Doctors have discovered this. But God knew about this from the very beginning. That forgiveness was going to be a thing that was going to cause us to be healthy spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Doctors have discovered that. I'm just reading from their report. This is an enormous physical burden to bring to being hurt and disappointed, Karen Swartz says, the director of Mood Disorders Adult Consultation Clinic at Johns Hopkins. Chronic anger puts you into a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes, she says, in your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your immune response. Those changes can increase the risk of your depression, your heart disease, and your diabetes. Look at this. Among other conditions, forgiveness, however, she says, calms your stress levels, leading to improved health. Wow, this is from the medical community. They are confirming what the scripture says, that many are sickly among you. We need to strive at getting our hearts right, getting our emotions right, getting our, our self into a place of forgiveness. As Jesus said, if we forgive, God will forgive us. Forgiveness is so important. It goes on to say, can you learn to be more forgiving? The answer is yes. But forgiveness is not just saying the words. It's an active process in which you make a conscious decision to let go of negative feelings, whether the person deserves it or not. Isn't it a fact that we didn't really deserve forgiveness? Jesus Christ forgave us whether we deserved it or not. That's powerful. As you release your anger, Dr. Swartz says, and your resentment and hostility, you will begin to feel empathy for this person or these people. You will begin to feel compassion for them. You will even sometimes feel an affection for the person that wronged you, and you're thinking in your mind, how can this be? They did me so wrong, but yet I had this incredible compassion for this person. Think about Jesus on the cross. He was being wronged, he was being betrayed, ridiculed and mocked, and yet he forgave us. Not with resentment, not with remorse, but he gave, forgave us out of a true heart of compassion, empathy, and affection for us. He loved us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible said he loved us first. He loved us. He came for us. 
See, this emotional and physical and spiritual aspect of forgiveness, they capture in a little brochure that they put out. The benefits of forgiving someone, number one, gives a healthier relationships. Number two, it improves your mental health, by which I could use that. Less anxiety, less stress, and less hostility. I can use less stress. Lower blood pressure. Fewer symptoms of depression. I'm, you know, maybe some people that are depressed, that you're listening to this morning, you fight depression. Maybe your depression could be relieved if you are a more forgiving person. I'm not saying just you have something against somebody a long time ago, but you have this sense that you just kind of like have a hard time forgiving people on a regular daily basis. I'm going to share something about that in a moment. A stronger immune system. I'm all about being healthier, so I want to be healthy, so I want to forgive people. I don't want to be depressed, I want to forgive people. I want my blood pressure to be low, I want to forgive people. I don't want to have anxiety or stress or hostility, I want to forgive people. I want to have a good mental health, I want to forgive people. I want to have good healthy relationships, I want to forgive people. I want to have an improved heart health, it says, if we forgive. And another thing is this, is if you forgive people, you will actually feel better about yourself. You see, something small happened to me after I received this message, and I just sat down in my chair quickly just to kind of interject this one little thought. And the thought came to me, constant state of forgiveness. Constant state of forgiveness. And that I must stay in a constant state of forgiveness. And it doesn't matter where I'm at. It doesn't matter whether I'm at home with my wife or I mean, with dealing with church people, dealing with community people, dealing with friends and, and long-term relationships or past relationships, I must stay in a constant state of forgiveness. And I want to say this, I believe Jesus was able to stay and did stay in a constant state of forgiveness. He was constantly being ridiculed. They tried to kill him constantly. Tried to undermine him constantly, question him constantly. And can you just imagine this amount of unforgiveness that could have just literally overwhelmed him? I believe that staying in a constant state of forgiveness, that we're quick to forgive no matter what happens, whether we are right or wrong, and we quit trying to justify why we feel the way we do, that we will, as Johns Hopkins says, we will have a healthier life in every single aspect. Now, sometimes it's going to take confrontation. The Bible talks about if someone has hurt you or damaged you, or it says go and talk to them. That's not comfortable, and that takes time as well. By the time you talk to the person, you might have already processed the whole part of the forgiveness part. But we need to forgive. I'd like for us to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 30 through 32. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's no doubt there are people that we've hurt that we want them to forgive us. Not even knowing it sometimes we've hurt people, but we still want them to forgive us. The scripture says this, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not. Underline that in your Bibles. Highlight it on your phones or your tablets. Write it down. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Let, release, let go of all bitterness. It didn't say some. It said, in all wrath, it didn't say some, it said, in all anger, not some, all clamor, all evil speaking, speaking, let it go. It's not serving any good purpose for you, but damaging your life and damaging relationships. Let these things be put away from you, cast aside, buried. Make sure all malice is gone, malignancy. And then it says, and be kind one to another. Tender hearted. Look, look at this. Look at this verse, this part right here. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. 
Let all this stuff go. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, and forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Come on, folks. If you're at home, you need to be saying amen. You need to be shouting right now. God wants us to be forgivers. We're supposed to be made in the image of God. We're supposed to be acting like the dear son. We're supposed to be being conformed. So we're supposed to forgive. This should be part of who we are, part of our relationship and transformation into Christ, the new birth. I was listening to something that a lady said yesterday on the, as I was also looking up some more stuff and listening about forgiveness. And, you know, she made a statement about this. I thought it was kind of incredible because it's kind of scary. You ever watch these Disney movies with all these, um, the, the, the witches or the, you know, that uh, Ursula and all these people? I mean, they're, they're, they're always bitter. They're always unforgiving about where they're at, about who's pretty, who's not, who's got this, who's got that. The guy loves her or, or doesn't love me. And, and they're, they're always bitter. And then, uh, I, I can't remember the one it is about Ursula, she, the one that turns into the big, big octopus or whatever. is a big monster. But they're all like that because they're bitter. They're unforgiving. Now, we don't want to look like that, do we? We don't want to be bitter. We don't want to be trying to kill people and take people out. We don't want to be you ugly and wicked like that. We want to be godly. Let's don't be like Disney's witches. Let's be like God's kids. Let's be like Jesus. You see, sometimes when this unforgiveness happens, sometimes, and maybe a lot of the times, you have a right to be mad. You, you, everything might have happened that, that, yes, everything here equals me being mad, me being an unforgiving person. But I just want to say this. You can't stay mad. You shouldn't stay mad. You got to forgive. You must forgive. Can I just say this? Forgiveness is a requirement of the Holy Scriptures. It's not a suggestion, people. Forgive if you want to. Forgive if you feel like it. It is highly recommended that you forgive. And as Johns Hopkins said, it is good for your health. It's not a suggestion, folks. It's a recommendation. It's like if the doctor says, don't do this and you're going to get better. But you just say, I'm going to keep doing this and you still feel horrible. Do what the doctor says. Do what Dr. Jesus says. Forgive people. You see, Jesus spent his life teaching these 12 disciples of him this, his, this godly truth, forgiveness. Again, Matthew 6 talks about it. That's at the very beginning of their training, forgiveness. And if we don't forgive, God won't forgive us forgiveness. And obviously they had to deal with, with the same thing in their life because they were betrayed, they were abused, they were misused, they were lied about, they were killed. They had to forgive. It's a godly truth, forgiveness. It's an eternal truth, forgiveness. It's an incredible truth, forgiveness, that will be the last words almost out of Jesus' mouth. We may say it's a constant dealing with attitudes that Jesus had with the scribes and the Pharisees. He had to forgive, or people in general, he had to forgive. They questioned his integrity. They questioned what he did, why he did it, how he did it. He could have dealt with unforgiveness. We could say in, in the, his final fear in the garden was maybe the, a thing that he had to deal with. Unforgiving, like, I don't know if I want to do this, Lord. I can't, you know, would you let me out of this? The conspiracy against him. He had to deal with forgiveness. The undermining, the cunningness, the deceitfulness, the despicable acts of Judas the betrayer. He had to forgive him as likewise. It's a great, great issue. Maybe the lying about him, the accusations, the disdain of people, and even the so-called spiritual people of the day, he had to deal with this unforgiveness, no doubt. Maybe his disappointment, disappointment in Peter, how Peter, you know, would speak back towards him and forget, he had to forgive Peter. Or maybe how Peter missed out on the what the kingdom was all about and he chops off the high priest ear and Jesus has to go and heal the man right there and you know that disappointment that unforgiving Peter about Peter you just don't get it 
We may say it was the beating, the passion of the Christ. And you know, we saw that some years ago, and, and people even stood up and, and said, please stop it. It was just so, it was so uh, gory, so awful. We might say that that beating was where the unforgiveness Jesus had to deal with was all about and, and how he had to work through it. He had to carry the cross. He was nailed to the cross. How big the spikes were. I mean, this unforgiveness is something that's just potentially rolling around in Jesus' life. How he was hung up literally like a piece of meat. How he was tagged mockingly as a king and hearing all these things, dealing with all this stuff. I mean, everything all on top of him at one time. The betrayal, the, the beating, the abuse, the words of hate, the words of undermining. The pain, gagging for life, he couldn't breathe, no one to help him, pierced with a sword, and he had done nothing to deserve any of this. And many times we've done nothing to deserve what's happened to us, but there's something greater at work here. Can we forgive? Can we take on the very nature of Christ and forgive? But I want you to think about this one last thing as we talked about Jesus how Jesus taught from the beginning to his disciples about forgiving. You can read scripture after scripture after scripture in the Bible where he talks about this aspect of forgiving. A principle that he used time and time again. He poured into his guys because it was going to be such a vital part of their life. And here Jesus is in the book of Luke chapter 23, 34. Jesus said, Father, after everything has happened, after everything has been done to him, after the beating, after the lashing, after the abuse and the betrayal, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. That's listed in the book of Luke. The doctor. Forgive them. The importance of our health, the importance of our life, the importance of our spiritual well-being, the importance of eternity, the importance of heaven for us to forgive. Because many times people really don't know what they're doing. They don't even know sometimes they hurt you. They don't even think about it. Sometimes they're self-absorbed. Sometimes they're insensitive. Sometimes they do something before they think about it. But Jesus says, Forgive them. If Jesus Christ could forgive after what he went through, just that one day alone, not counting everything else he went through the rest of his, other parts of his life, if he, could, if he could look down and say, Father, forgive them, the very guys that have, had put the spikes in his hands and his feet, the very guys that had put a spear into him, the very guys that had mocked him. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. If Jesus Christ can do that, I guarantee you there's none of us that's in this audience listening, and anybody that you'll ever know that went through anything even remotely close to that, and we have a hard time forgiving, it's a shame on us. Now just remember, I didn't say forget. I just said forgive. That's the beginning place. Forgive. In the book of Matthew chapter 18, Jesus talk, is talking to Peter. Peter comes to him and Peter says, Lord, this is awesome. This is where my wake up 4.38 in the morning happened. Peter said, Lord, how... Often shall my brother... Now, he didn't say the, the sinner. He didn't say the infidel, infidelity. He said, my brother. Talking about relational here. How often shall my brother sin against me? And how often shall I forgive him? And then he says, well, maybe seven times. If I do it seven times and he does it the eighth time, then... He's gone. He's eradicated. He's, he's, he's too far gone. That's probably what Peter thought. I mean, that's why he said. And Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, I say unto you, 
until seven times, or not just seven times, but until 70 times seven. Wow. Now remember, the first place where Jesus says forgive them is from the Dr. Luke. That part, that gospel about Luke, about the servant. This comes from Matthew, which is supposed to be written to, uh, from the standpoint of the king. Of the kingdom ministry, the kingdom. This is a kingdom principle. Forgiveness is a kingdom principle. It's not optional. It's something that we need to do, should do, something that is not just a suggestion, but is a high recommendation to do this if we want to proceed forth in life. He said, not just seven times, Peter. That's the easy way out. But 70 times seven, that's 490. But it's not really talking about an amount of times that you sit down and take note of every time somebody's offended you and hurt you. It's talking about an infinite number. It's talking about, Peter, I don't care how many times it happens, you got to forgive. Now, I'll guarantee you there's people that's listening to this right now today that you have been hurt by the same person more than once. More than once. Maybe you grew up in a family where your parents hurt you over and over and over again. Maybe one of your parents, or maybe a sibling, or maybe a friend, or maybe a neighbor, or maybe someone you grew up with. Maybe they're not always difficult things or harsh things. Maybe it's nothing even close to what Jesus went through. But maybe think about husbands and wives sometimes, the, the little spats you have, that you have to always be sure that you're in forgiveness because your relationship depends on it. The longevity, the health of relationship depends on it. And that goes with anyone and everyone that our forgiveness is what causes our relationships to be maintained and healthy. Seventy times seven. Think about that. Just think about that. Peter was looking for an easy way out. We're not, we can't have an easy way out because Jesus didn't have an easy way out. And we're supposed to be like Jesus, conformed to his image. That we have the same kind of heart. That we don't, listen, this is the deal. That we don't write down the wrongs. That we don't write down the wrongs. Maybe you should read 1 Corinthians 13. We don't keep a ledger of wrongs. And then at the end of this chapter, and you can go read the whole chapter, which is amazing, because it talks about the mercy of one person and forgiveness and, and the lack of mercy and, and forgiveness of the other person and, and what happens to them. But Matthew 18, 35 says this, So likewise my heavenly Father do also unto you, if from your hearts... Forgive not everyone his brother, his trespasses. And he's talking about serving time in a prison place. Now we might think that if we don't forgive a person that we are hurting them. We're getting back at them. They're getting punishment from that. No, no. What it's saying is this, is that if you don't forgive, you're the one that's in prison. You're the one that's in jail. You're the one that's really being punished. Unforgiveness punishes you. Unforgiveness puts you in prison. Unforgiveness alienates you. Unforgiveness isolates you. Unforgiveness, as Johns Hopkins says, will pretty much kill you. My question is, how do we even embrace this thing about forgiveness. How can we wrap our heads around it? It's just like it's more than I can handle. It's more than I can just think about sometimes. Do you realize what they did to me? How they, how they hurt me? But yet Jesus on that cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, that was in his DNA to forgive. The very essence of the Father. In us as believers, having that incorruptible seed born and birthed into us through Jesus Christ, we are supposed to have the same DNA, but have we snuffed it out? Have we suppressed it? Have we put it in prison? Seventy times seven is what we're supposed to do. Can I ask you a question? How are we doing with that? How are we doing with this thing called forgiveness? 
I'm going to ask you again, how, how are you doing with this thing called unforgiveness? Is it helping you? Or is it just a constant, just rubbing you, angst in you, something you just can't get free of? It's got you in prison. Sure, we're going to be tempted not to forgive because it says that in Matthew 6. Sure, we're afraid to forgive. It's going to happen again. The Bible says no, there's no fear in perfect love. Sure, we think we're going to get betrayed all over again. You see, we, we must choose. We must choose to forgive. He chose to forgive. It, w it was seen that he, he didn't let his feelings get in the way of this important principle of forgiving. His emotions, obviously, not his physical strength, which had been stripped of him. He was able to forgive. This was an act of his heart. Not an emotional, not feelings, not his processes, but this was an act of his heart, the heart of God that was in him. You see, the spirit of man is amazing. The spirit of man that God put in us is amazing it is, and what it's able to do in the worst situations. Have you heard of these feats of strength and survival that in most cases would kill a person and yet they overcame because of the spirit of man? And when we begin to really call on the spirit of forgiveness this in us by the spirit of the living God, we will be able to overcome the worst situation. Just like Jesus was able to cry out, Father, forgive them. See, I must tell you that eternity cries out quite the opposite from what the world says. The world says, let them have it. The world says, take their eye out. The world says, take their arm off. The world says, kill them. But Jesus says quite the contrary. Forgive them. Eternity has always cried out, forgive, forgive, forgive. Forgive one another as I've forgiven you. Forgiveness that sets your heart free and sets the heart of others free as well. You see, when we get to this place of forgiveness like Jesus, we can have an aha moment. How many of you would like to have an aha moment this morning? Just say amen to that. Because after Jesus, listen, after Jesus said, Father, forgive them. He said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He, at that point, he was perfectly clean. There was nothing in him because he was in a place of forgiveness. Then it gave up the ghost. I'm not talking about us physically dying, but I'm talking about getting to a place where we can have this aha moment where we said, I did it. I forgave them. I give up. I'm not going to hold it against them any longer. Jesus gave up the ghost. Jesus exhaled. Can I just remind you that in the beginning, God breathed into man the breath of life. And the course of time, Adam living was filled with life, in and out, in and out. But listen, can I tell you something? We need to have an exhale. We need to let this awful, awful air out of us, this stuff called carbon dioxide, which is a poison. We need to exhale unforgiveness. Whatever we have against someone, the resentment, the hurt, whatever. We need to exhale it. We need to give it up just like Jesus did. My question is, is have you forgiven? Have you exhaled this carbon dioxide, this dirty air that's in you? What happens if you don't exhale? You die. <laughs> you suffocate, basically. You see, again, I'll remind you, forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. It doesn't mean returning back to normal, although I've seen it happen. I've seen relationships that have been horribly damaged. I've seen infidelities in, in marriages and, and just some way, somehow, the slate was wiped clean. Relationships broken over myriads of things. You see, trust does have to be rebuilt. It has to be restored. It has to be reignited. 
But for trust to come, you got to start with forgiveness. This is the heart of it. You've got to forgive. Yes, they hurt you, they disappointed, they abused you, they damaged you, but you have to forgive. For me to get free and for a relationship to be rebuilt and start again, we must forgive. Unforgiveness again puts us in chains and puts other people in prison. I want to challenge you to read Matthew 18, 21 to 35 if you're having a problem with this message and see what happens when you don't forgive. A few weeks ago, in getting ready to close, I was watching this show called Seal Team. It's about seals. It's about these really tough, macho guys. And they had a guy on the Seal Team. They'd done a a mission, and this there was a new guy with their group and their unit, and um, they're trying to rescue someone. and And he'd done something that had killed a person. And so there's a video clip played, and the video clip seems to indicate that another person did it because they didn't have this proper angle, because they, they were watching everything they did. Well, they, so they asked him, and he denied it, and they asked the guy that was his, his superior, and, and he took the blame because it looked as though he was the last person there at that site of where the person was killed. So eventually, through a process of time and elimination, they went through, and, they, and this guy wouldn't back down from it. And the other guy said, well, I'll take, I will just take the blame, which is what Jesus did for us. He took the blame for this other guy. Even though there was no really hard evidence, it just looked like he was in the wrong place, that he'd done the wrong thing, that he was responsible for death. Well, it came out that the guy had lied, that the guy really had done it, the guy, and the guy knew he'd done it, but he just didn't want to admit it because he was afraid he was going to lose the relationship and the camaraderie with the team. So the team had a meeting, and some of the guys were very, very angry, but the guy that was actually going to give up his bar is going to give up his badge give up his place, his position, his team, his family. He was getting ready to do that, and all of a sudden, the, this new thing came to light. He was upset, and they sent the man out of the room, and they began to talk amongst themselves, as kind of the way they are. And they just talked, but there was no real decision made, because they said, we're going to leave it in his hands. The guy that was falsely accused was going to take the fall. You see, Jesus was falsely accused, but he took the fall for us. The guy comes back in, and they call this gentleman up, and he asked the guy to come to the end of the table, and all the rest of the guys are watching, and I'm watching, I'm thinking, what is he going to do? Is he going to hit him? Is he going to you know, throw him out the door, or what's going to happen? And he grabs the guy and just hugs him. I'm thinking, what is going on here? Is, is, is this really going to, I mean, he's going to let him stay with the team? And he's hugging him, and the guy's hugging him back because the guy's afraid he's going to, you know, what, if, what's going to happen. And the guy says that has been wronged, he says, I for, he says, I love you, man. I forgive you. And then he, I think this has happened, he disembraced him, you know, backed up a little bit. He says, but I don't trust you. I just thought the part where he just hugged him and said, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. I thought it was amazing because that's kind of where we have to start. I forgive you. I love you. I don't trust you. But this is our starting point. I'm just trying to get you started today. I'm trying to get you on a bike with training wheels. Let's just get on the bike. Let's just try to forgive. Let's ask the Lord to help us forgive. And again, as we said, doctors are discovering what God already knew about forgiveness. Unforgiveness will make you sick. Back to what Dr. Schwartz says. Forgiveness, we have to make it a part of our life. Forgiveness is a choice. You are choosing to offer compassion and empathy to a person that wronged you. And they gave some steps, which are, could be biblical steps on how to develop a more forgiving attitude that will help us emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Reflect and remember, this did happen. Empathize with the person, which is something that kind of goes unnoticed a lot of times. 
Forgive deeply. In other words, really mean it. Really put your heart into it. You've got to let go of expectations. How this person's going to respond. If they're going to do better. If they're going to really kind of come up to the table. Don't expect anything out of them. Just forgive them. That's what it talks about going the extra mile. Giving your coat and your cloak. You must decide to forgive. It's not something you're just going to fall into. Just all of a sudden one morning you wake up. Oh, I forgive him. No, you have to decide to forgive. And then you also have to forgive yourself. Because sometimes you have the mentality that it was your fault. It was your fault. So I just want to challenge you today. If you haven't heard what I said, I've been talking about forgiveness. I've been talking about how important and valid it is for you. It's a kingdom principle. And again in Matthew chapter 6, I believe it's verse 14, it says, If you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. How are you doing with that? Where are you at with that? That is a powerful, powerful verse. If you've got something against someone today, and you're holding on forgiveness, I just want to, I plead with you according to this scripture here. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Father will forgive you also. I want to live in the forgiveness of God. Jesus went to the cross for us. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And many times people don't know what they're doing. They have, they're, just, they're just completely oblivious to what they're doing. Let's pray. So, Father, we come in Jesus' name. We just ask you right now, God, that you will help us forgive. Help us walk through the process. Lord, help us decide to do it. Help us not to have expectations. But our expectation is from you. Lord, we expect you to help us forgive people that maybe in our own mind are unforgivable, that have done too much, that owe us too much, that have damaged us too much. Matthew 18 talks about that. Lord, we ask you today in Jesus' name, help us forgive just like you did for us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope this helped you a lot. Um, and we'll be back here next week. And I'll, I do want to say one thing. I want to f ask your forgiveness because I, I said that I was going to give you daily updates last week. And I didn't do that. We were so busy. I'll try to do better this week. We'll try to give an update here or there. But please forgive me if you, didn't, if you were expecting that. I dropped the ball. God bless you. We love you.